All right, welcome to week two. We are going to cover chapter three of the book. And so the book you don't have. And so what we're going to look at is job order costing. And so chapter four will be the other kind of costing, which is called process costing. So in this chapter, what we're doing is we're making a bunch of goods that all look that are all different, like all specialty jobs. So every job we do is like a custom made product. So the first thing that we would talk about is the fact that we have process systems and job order systems. Job order systems is what we're focusing on in this chapter and they're specialized goods. A process costing system is one where we're making a bunch of stuff that all looks the same. So in the process costing system, it'll be like a manufacturing environment where we're making like toilet paper or pop or something like that. So job order systems could be any customized goods. So if we're making like customized cars, or if we're making class rings or construction companies when they're building homes, these are all customized goods. So the first thing I wanna do is kind of go through some of the information that you keep track of in a job order system. And most of these things are kept track of electronically. And so when I talk about the actual documents, a lot of times it's an electronic document, but it's still a document that you keep track of. So in this chapter, what we're going to do is we're going to make specialty jewelry. So we're making goods like rings and things like that. So our raw material is going to be items like diamonds and emeralds and sapphires and blocks of gold and bars of, of gold and silver and stuff. So one of the things we keep track of is a materials ledger. And the materials ledger is going to keep track of the material we have on hand. So it's going to show a record of the amount of each kind of material on hand. So we'll have a like ledger, which would be like a T account for every different kind of inventory. So one for one carat diamonds or half carat diamonds or whatever. So the quantity of material used, every time we need to go to the storage room and get material out, we are gonna fill out something called a material requisition. And this is a new word for us, requisition. And it stems from the word require. And what it means is that we require materials. So this material requisition will provide authorization for material to be released from the storage area. So I think that was actually on the next line, but like that. So released from the storage area. So this is how the goods are allowed to leave the storage area. So before we release the goods, if we're in charge of the storage room, so let's say that one of you guys, normally I'm pointing at people in class, but one of you guys is in charge of the storage room. If someone wanders in and they're like, hey, I need 10 one carat diamonds, we're going to be like, you don't work in manufacturing like you're the accountant for the business like why are you asking for diamonds so the only way we release goods is if we have a material requisition and the material requisition will list the job that we're working on and how many of different items we need so that the person in charge of the storage room only releases goods to people who actually need the goods for a specific job it's just a way to keep us accountable it's one of those internal control procedures that we learned about in financial accounting so for labor, we're going to keep track of our time on a time ticket. And so this is going to show the amount of um, time per job. So time per job and the labor cost. So for every job, if you're a laborer, for every job you do, you're going to keep track of your time. And so when you keep track of your time, you're going to write down like how many minutes or hours. Um, when I when I did this in an accounting firm, I kept track by the quarter hour. Um, sometimes it's more specific than that even, but um, how much time you spend on each job. So um, when I worked at a CPA firm before I started working at Friends and actually after, because I did taxes on the side, um, I always had to keep track of every individual job I was working on and how long it took me. And then I had to keep track of my billable hours, my chargeable time to make sure that I was um, staying um, profitable to the company um, to make sure I was actually working on jobs. And then they could bill the customers, the clients based on the amount of time I spent. So 
on the um, on the records for every individual job, we're going to keep track of how much time we spend on it. So this is like your little time card, but it's keeping track per job. And so the job cost sheet is going to be a document we fill out for each job. Now, again, it might be an electronic document, but for every job we do, we're going to keep track of the cost of the job. So we're going to list, list direct material for material requisitions. From material requisitions and we're going to list direct labor from the time tickets and then we're going to calculate overhead so if you guys remember there are three product costs direct material direct labor and overhead so we're going to keep track of those three costs per job and then all of the jobs that are in process will be kept track of in a cost ledger and then as we finish the jobs, we move them to the finished goods ledger. So we have three different ledgers. So I think I like to think of it as like a three three drawer filing cabinet. And in the top drawer, we have direct materials. And so all of our material ledgers go in there. So all of our individual uh, materials that we're using. And in the middle drawer, we have basically the cost ledger, which is kind of like WIP. And all of our jobs that are in process are in that drawer. And then as we finish a job, we'll pull that file out and move it to the bottom drawer, which is the finished goods ledger. And that's where we keep track of all of our jobs that are completed. Okay, so this is an example of a job cost sheet. And I make reference to this job cost sheet a lot. Um, this is just a picture of one I found online. Um, and actually, you guys will be able to identify that there's problems with it <laughs> because there are some issues. But what we're doing is we're making two special order couplings. And so a coupling is something that attaches two things together. And we are going to keep track of the cost of these two special order couplings that we're creating. So it looks like for direct material, we have three different requisitions. We went back to the storage room three times and got more material. So we spent a total of 1404 on direct material. And then we have four different people working on this job. So they worked a total of 27 hours for $180. And now this is where you'd see the problem because this time ticket 851 is 10 hours, but it's only 54 bucks. So apparently we're only paying that person 540 an hour, which is not legal, but it used to be legal. <laughs> so um, that's where that's at. And so in total, we spent 27 hours. So direct material and direct labor are direct costs, and they're really easy to track to individual jobs because you know how much material went into the job and you know how much labor went into the job. But then we have to figure out how to assign overhead to the job. So when we're trying to figure out how to assign overhead to a job, it's not as easy. You can't look at the couplings and say, wow, I see like so overhead on the, on the item. You can see material and you can calculate labor. But when you look at it, you can't be like, wow, that took $7 of rent, you know? So you can't track overhead directly to it, but we have to be able to assign some overhead to the job so we can figure out the cost of the job so that we can charge the customers for the job. So in this particular problem, it looks like the rate we're gonna use is $8 per direct labor hour. So every time we have one hour of direct labor, we're gonna give it $8 of overhead. So in this job, it took 27 hours of labor. So 27 times eight, we're gonna give this job $216 of overhead. So the total cost of the job then, you would add direct material, direct labor and overhead together and we get 1800, that's two couplings. So that's 900 each. So then as we ship them to the customers, then we will remove it from finished goods and send it to cost of goods sold as we actually finish the jobs, okay? So the next thing that we look at is, um, and normally I break the whole class into groups and we do this activity. And so as far as doing it online, I just want to talk about different jobs and different tasks that people do. So normally I assign those tasks to different students and I would have you guys come up with the answers to these questions, but that's a little bit harder to do since we're online. So I'm just going to walk through the different jobs. So I have a production scheduler, a purchasing agent, the people who work in receiving, the storeroom supervisors, the, the direct laborers, the skilled craftsmen, and then we have the accountants. So let's start with the production scheduler. And so we just got a new order and we're gonna make the, the rings for the World Series. So the World Series rings for the winning baseball team. And so the first thing we would need to do for the production scheduler is we would need to find time to do the job. So we would need to look at all the other jobs we're doing and determine when we're going to be able to make these rings and maybe move some other stuff around because this is a time sensitive job. 
So we would also look to see if um, we would check with the people in the storage room and see if we have the materials on hand. And if we don't, then we need to let them know that they need to order some goods. So assume the materials need to be ordered. The company's purchasing agent is going to order the materials. And so to tell them what we need them to order, we're going to do a materials requisition. Now, we heard that word requisition earlier, remember? So a materials requisition, um, actually, I think we're going to call this one, it, it is a materials requisition, but it's going to be a purchase requisition. So a purchase requisition means I require, because requisition means require, a purchase. So this is us telling the purchasing agent who um, that is a different person than us what they need to order. So we would, we would tell them we need 48 one carat diamonds or whatever we need. So when the purchasing agent gets that purchase requisition, the purchasing agent, basically, if you go to work as a purchasing agent, then your job is to be like a buyer of the inventory that we need, of the supplies and different things that we need. So the purchasing agent, when they get that order, when they get that purchase requisition, they need to buy the goods. And so they are going to shop around and get the best quality and price. So they're going to keep an eye on both items. It needs to be good quality, but also needs to be the right price. So they're going to order the goods that we need um, based on that. And so they need to make sure that they get there on time and that they're a good quality. So the purchasing agents order the goods and then the receiving department is actually going to receive the goods. And when they receive the goods, they're going to fill out what's called a receiving report. So fill out receiving report. Um, we're going to count the goods and take to storage room. Okay, so we're going to take those goods to the storage room. The storage room is the um, is a different room than where we're at. We received the goods and now we're going to deliver them to the storage room where that person will store them until we need them for the actual job. So the, the storeroom supervisor, again, a different person, um, is going to actually, um, when they get the goods, they're going to count them. Because you never know, there was the people in the receiving department, they might have tried to steal some. So they might have slipped a couple diamonds in their pocket. So we're going to recount them and then we're going to lock them up to make sure that they stay safe until we need them. We're going to update the material ledger and make sure that all of our material on hand is correct. So the next question said, would you give materials to any employee you ask for them? what would the storeroom supervisor need in order to give material to a, to a production employee? And so before we release the goods, we need to see a completed material requisition. And so that would say how many items we need for a specific job. And so we don't release them unless that happens. And so if someone comes in and let's say it's Torwin and he comes in and he's like, hey, I need seven diamonds. And we're, then you'd be like, Tor, you're the custodian. You clean for us. You do not need seven diamonds. So you do not get, we do not release any material to anyone unless they have a, <laughs> a filled in material requisition. Um, so the next person is a skilled craftsman. And the skilled craftsman is going to be the one that's actually putting the rings together. They're going to actually make the goods. And so they're going to fill out a time ticket, which is just their time card. And they're going to show how much time they spend on every individual job so we know how to build our customers. And so then the accountant comes along and they need to determine the total cost to make the ring. So this blank needs to be bigger probably, but to determine the cost to make the ring, they're going to get direct material from material requisitions. They're going to get direct labor from the time ticket. And then they're going to calculate the overhead. And so they're going to fill out the job cost sheet based on that. And so jobs that are completed are in the finished goods ledger and jobs that are still in process are in the cost ledger. So we keep talking about giving the job some overhead. And so now we're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about that idea of overhead and how to actually come up with a rate to give a job some overhead. So when we were talking about our special order couplings, we said our rate was $8 per direct labor hour. And so you decide on a driver based on how costs occur in your business. And so some businesses use a lot of machines, and so we might use machine hours. Some of them have mainly direct laborers, so we would use direct labor hours. And so at the accounting firm where I worked, it would have been based on direct labor hours because I would be the direct laborer, the accountant that was actually doing the tax return. So 
Let's talk through this concept. So assume that you're responsible for planning a banquet for your school's student-led investment club. So let's say that Carter Bowen and his friends are all creating a banquet. They're going to have a banquet, and the banquet's going to have a dinner followed by a speaker. And the costs associated with the banquet are as follows. So we have meals at $10 a person. We're going to provide them a beverage, coffee and or tea for a dollar a person. And then we have to pay $50 to use the banquet room, and we also have to pay $100 for the speaker. So those are the costs for the banquet, and we decide that we want, we want to be able to break even. So we're not trying to make money on this banquet, but we also can't lose money. So we're trying to be okay with covering all of our costs. And so if 50 people are going to attend the banquet, 5 -0, 50 people are going to attend the banquet, then what do we need to charge for a ticket? And so the first thing we would say is, well, we have to give them each a meal and some beverages. So I know it's going to be 11 bucks for that, right? So we're going to pay $11 for each person that comes to it. These are direct costs because I can directly trace them to every individual person and that's easy. But this $150 is overhead. We have to pay $50 to use the banquet room and $100 for the speaker. So this $150, we're going to spread that over 50 people which would basically be $3 a person. So in total, we need to charge $14 for a ticket. So my answer is 14. And the reason why is we're gonna spread the $150 over 50 people, which is three per person. And then we would add to that the 11 of the direct costs. So that's where the $14 comes from. There's other ways to do it. You could have came up with, when I ask students to do it in class, sometimes they say, okay, I'm gonna spend 10 times 50 on meals, which is $500 and 50 and 50 and 100, and then add all those together and divide by 150. And that works too, or drive by, I'm sorry, divide by 50, because 50 people are coming. So. Um, okay, so that example was pretty straightforward because every person that attends the banquet needs to pick up a little bit of the banquet room and speaker fee. So let's look at this situation a little bit differently. So a lot of times overhead costs aren't going to be divided over the numbers of units produced. So assume that we make TVs. And so we're making TVs and we're the manufacturer. And so our machines are basically creating the machine, the TVs. So we have um, we have a lot of machinery in our business and we're gonna spend $500,000 on overhead. So what we do is we estimate, we estimate what we think we're gonna spend on overhead this year. And we think our overhead is gonna be $500. Now remember what overhead is. We learned that in chapter two. So overhead is rent on the factory, utilities on the factory, supervisor salaries, um, indirect material like cleaning supplies and like the oil to change the oil in the machines and all those things are overhead, okay? So we're gonna spend in the next coming year $500,000 on overhead and we're gonna make 50,000 TVs, okay? So if we're gonna make 500,000, um, if we're gonna spend 500,000 on overhead, and we're going to make 50,000 TVs, it would make sense to just do $10 per TV. But this is when I stop and I usually ask the students, how many TVs do you have in your house? And they start counting and they're like, oh, there's one in the living room and there's one in my parents' bedroom or in my bedroom, there's one in my brother's room. And we go through, maybe you have one downstairs, maybe it's a big one, maybe you have a big TV in your basement and like a little production room, media room kind of thing. So we figure it out. And then, we, and then I say, are all those TVs the same? Are they the same size? And they're like, no, we have big one downstairs, little one in the bedroom, whatever. So it doesn't really make sense to say that it's $10 a TV if all the TVs are different, right? So some of them are really big and some of them are really small because I would think that it takes a lot longer to make you know, a 75 inch big screen versus a 32 inch TV you have in your bedroom. So what we would do instead is maybe we would say, all right, well, how long does it take to make one? And maybe we'll allocate our costs a little bit differently. So let's do this example. We have a company and they're going to spend a million dollars on overhead. So they're looking at their coming year and they're going to spend one million on overhead. And our factory is highly automated. So we've decided that the majority of our overhead is because of machinery, depreciation, electricity, repairs and maintenance of that machine, the machines. So machine hours is going to be our driver. And so um, we've decided that we're going to allocate based on machine hours. 
And so we estimate that we're going to run our machines 40,000 hours during the year. So basically what we would say is this is how many machines we have, and this is how many hours a day we work and how many weeks a year. And we decide we're going to run our machines 40,000 hours. Okay. So to come up with our predetermined overhead rate, our predetermined overhead rate, this is the rate that we use to assign overhead. We're going to estimate our overhead and divide by estimated driver. Our driver in our problem is machine hours. So we're going to take 1 million divided by 40,000. So I don't know if there's anything under here. Yeah. Okay. It's not lining up right, but it's there. So we're going to say 1 million divided by 40,000 hours, and that equals $25 per hour. So every time the machines run one hour, we're going to give it $25 of overhead. So I want to pause a second and go back to page two. And on page two, we had that special order coupling. And the special order couplings, our rate was $8 per direct labor hour. So to come up with that rate, we didn't see this because we just saw the job cost sheet. But to come up with this rate, they did estimated overhead divided by estimated direct labor hours. And so the predetermined overhead rate is predetermined, meaning that it's done in the beginning with estimates. So we come up with that rate and then we say, okay, $8 an hour. And so 27 hours, 27 times eight, 216. So in our example, we've got $25 an hour. So every time we spend one hour, we're gonna give it $25 of overhead. So then it says calculate the overhead that would be allocated to a job that took three and a half hours. So 25 times 3.5 is 87.50. So $87.50 is the amount that we would assign for overhead. We would take that cost and we would add it to the direct material and direct labor to get the total cost for the job. Okay, so the overhead should be related to how costs occur. So it wouldn't make sense to use machine hours if you're a doctor's office, because there's not a lot of machines in doctor's offices. And so it would probably be based on physician hours. So how much time does the, does the doctor spend with the client, the customer? So we have to make sure when we are assigning overhead that we have a good driver, that a driver that makes sense, okay? So, when we get to chapter seven, we're gonna learn about activity-based costing. Activity-based costing is when we have different drivers for different activities. And so instead of having one predetermined overhead rate, we might have seven. And then we might have, you know, like if we're looking at, um, one of my students currently is doing HVAC work on the side, so he's fixing air conditioners. So for his costs, it might be number of miles to the drive site, how long does it take to do the job? I mean, there, there will be multiple costs involved. Uh, okay, so I think this is a nice place to pause and then um, I'm gonna do my part two of the video. So let me go ahead and stop and then I'll restart.